Hey, welcome everybody. We are on podcast, the On Microsoft podcast, the only one for the On Microsoft website. Uh, just to make sure, if you guys are floating around looking for another one, there isn't one. <laughs> uh, my name is Kareem, and I'm here joined with the world's greatest co-host today. Earth Bacchus. Yeah, and it's uh, it's been a week. It's been a long week. It's been a uh, news-filled week, and so we're going to be talking about all the news uh, that happened this week and news that we expect to uh, hear about from next week. So our first topic, uh, I have my hat ready here for it. Because every time we have big Windows 10 news, we have to put on this hat. <laughs> he dust out the, and for those of you who are listening, he's dusting out of the old, what is that? What kind of blue is that? Powder blue dev Windows hat? Windows dev hat. hat, yep. So our first topic is about Windows 10X. I mean, it's a topic that you guys seem to be pretty interested in. Because our video about it has over 3,000 views now at this point. So I know, small pat on the back. Thank you yep. all. Yep, so we were able to get hands-on with a leaked version of Windows 10X. So we're here to pretty much recap that video and discuss some of the changes between the dual-screen version of Windows 10X that we saw earlier this year and the single-screen version of Windows 10X, which a bill just leaked for online. That's our first topic. But there's still more about Windows 10, which is why... Yeah, if you were, if you were still hungry for more Windows... We have your Windows. We know you guys wanted Windows. <laughs> put Windows in your Windows on our Windows podcast. <laughs> and we'll be talking about the uh, big expose that Zach Bowden had over at Windows Central for the Samaka, uh, which is supposed to be this uh, big UI refresh design uh, that's supposed to be coming to Windows, which is, is, you know, just for the gist of it, it's more rounded edges, a softer looking design language, not so much the jagged uh, crossings and edges of Metro. Uh, also figuring out how to finally use the shade of gray that is actually consistent throughout the UI, more consistent UI, uh, moving things from um, the old, uh, uh, was it Windows 95 and uh, Windows 7 menus and beyond that, uh, Windows XP menus are all gonna be shifting over to the new Windows setting style. Um, so that's big on it. Uh, there's some other things about it, but yeah, we're gonna talk about that as well. And then let's not forget the other big topic that everyone always loves to hear about, which is Surface news. Windows well, technically, device. Well, technically, See, it's, it's on Windows podcast. Depending on how you look at it, it might not be news or might be news, but We're the Mi news. <laughs> Microsoft came up with the Surface Pro 7 Plus, which apparently is only for education and commercial customers. But Ooh. anyone can get their hands on with it, and oh, it's a. Yay! <laughs> we wrote a piece about how you could do that, but it's a new Surface device from Microsoft, and we'll recap what's new with the Surface Pro 7 Plus and what you could expect if you're hoping to pick one up this year. Which brings us to our next topic. Even more devices. Uh, while all this is going on, it was, you know, you could be forgiven if you'd forgotten that CS was around, it was happening because it wasn't a big event, uh, in-person event. You know, everything was kind of virtual meetings and virtual showcases. But yeah, CS happened uh, basically all of last week uh, and going into last weekend. So we'll do kind of a recap of some of the big notes, some of the, the milestones and things that uh, we look forward to for throughout the rest of the year. So let's get started with the biggest topic of them all is Windows 10X leak. So if, you, if you're a Microsoft person and you've been on Twitter this last week, you probably saw, I believe the account is called Albacore or at the book is closed. Um, he leaked a, a virtual hard disk file, which contains a, a sample build of Windows 10X. And to be clear, this isn't an official build. It's not the RTM build, which we spoke about a couple of podcasts ago. This is a leaked VHD, a leaked version of Windows 10X for single screen devices, which is what Windows 10X is all about now. And to be clear, it's also different from the official Windows 10X image, which people were testing earlier this year, which was only for dual screen devices. But between January 2020 and January 2021, Windows 10X has completely done a 360, which is it's not for dual screen devices anymore. It's only for single screen devices now. So I believe uh, I'll let Kareem just like go through some of the quick changes and then I'll go a little bit more in depth. Uh, as far as uh, Microsoft design for Windows 10 X, um, Zach, who again, is, seems to be the largest source of information coming out, uh, again, take it with a grain of salt, but he keeps saying that it is intended to be 
uh, what we all think, what we all thought, which was a Chrome OS kind of competitor, a lightweight image on a device that um, should help Microsoft compete better with uh, Chrome OS. Um, the issue that I'm having with it, with that being just uh, the case, is that they already have Windows 10 S mode, and I believe that with a few tweaks and refinements, uh, the Sun Valley visual update, that they already had it's what they needed with it. Uh, now, there is a kind of a theory that uh, we in the chat, uh, Eric and myself, have been kind of uh, thinking about, and I think uh, Joe mentioned it last week, uh, about uh, what is it being built on dot, uh, .NET, .NET or, 6 or .NET yes. 5 or some, a new version of .NET. Yes, and that with that being said, if that if it's if it's built on that, then it could be a whole new ball game for Microsoft as far as what it can how the flexibility it can offer in the future for that. Uh, so again, just keeping an eye on what Windows 10X was stated as, which is supposed to be going on like devices for that Lenovo X Carbon Fold or whatever they had, and ThinkPad big, X One Fold. Yeah. These big, you know, ten plus inch foldable devices, which oh, I believe only maybe one or two companies came out with. That's what it started off as in 2019. Now it's kind of evolved into, as far as we can tell, a Chrome OS competitor for single screen, and who knows what it could be in the future. But after you mentioned Chrome OS, after playing around with this uh, this leaked version, this leaked build, I that's pretty much what I think it is. Everyone has been saying it's just basically Chrome OS because all the start menu has moved from the right left to the center and you click the start button and you get a big square and you have a search box up top. No more live tiles, just centered, just centered icons, static icons, your list of apps. Then beneath your list of apps, you have your most recent documents. You click a document. If it's in stored in your OneDrive, it goes to Edge. It takes you on the web. And then if it's stored locally, it opens the new file explorer, which I mentioned in my hands-on. is pretty. It, it's modern and it's slim, but it's also kind of dumbed down a bit. because it's Featureless. It's featureless because in 10X, well, the version that leaked, it, it could change. That's, that's what we keep saying. But in the leaked version that everyone went hands-on with, the only thing you have access to in the file explorer is OneDrive and your downloads. You don't have my PC. You don't have photos, you don't have videos, you don't have pictures. It just bundles everything into your downloads folder, which is exactly how it is on Google Chrome OS. Yeah, uh, I remember when I tested out the Chromebook uh, Duet for Lenovo, and this is one of my, I think the second Chrome OS device I'd ever used. It took some getting used to not having that granularity. Now, I mean, it is a streamlined approach. It's it's almost you know identical to what you, most people were uh, privy to on their smartphones. You know, you don't get uh, a lot of drill down into uh, your file system. And when you do, you tend to get lost uh, for the most part. All right. uh, so I can understand how this would be super simple for people and get them addicted to uh, OneDrive uh, when you don't have the same sort of uh, granularity and transparency into where your files are, you kind of become dependent on what you know. And if all you know is OneDrive keeps everything and you can organize in OneDrive uh, and you can organize on the go, meaning the web and stuff like that, then you know, as you as you or myself or other you know users going to the my PC, going into quick access, uh, that kind of stuff becomes kind of irrelevant. It'll just take some getting used to. Uh, what I'm interested in too is uh, how the new design is going to mesh with Sun Valley at some point. Well, because it turns in static icons. <laughs> Well, in terms of new design, there's a lot of things in this leaked build that I wish that regular Windows 10 had. It's just like the the small attention to detail that they put into this leaked build in 10X is really incredible. Like right now, if you minimize or close an app and it goes to the taskbar, the icon doesn't really do anything. But in this leaked 10X build, doing that makes the icon bounce and you actually see, oh, the app is minimizing and it's telling me, oh, it's minimizing. And there's also like more rounded corners and more more fluent design all throughout the operating system. And it's more clean and consistent. It's not a mix of old school windows and new school windows and stuff left over from Windows XP and Vista and 8.1 in a in a six-year-old 
operating hey, system. Hey, hey, some people like to hoard digital footprints, okay? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not here to judge. If you want to keep a little bit of Windows 8 in there, and every now and then you want to be surprised with a little Windows XP, who am I to judge, right? Well, the point is, it's, it's, a, it's a clean, modern version of Windows that puts the web first. Uh, if I didn't mention it like six times already, everything is pretty pretty much everything has to be done through Microsoft Edge with your PWAs like we discussed last week or through the Microsoft Store. Like, you know, download the Twitter app, download the Instagram app, download Spotify. It's a, it's a lightweight operating system that puts the web first. Which is great. And for those of you who hadn't had a chance to go listen to our podcast with Joe last week, he talks about the benefits and some of the huge drawbacks of relying on the power of the web. Um, there, there, you know, I can. There's a vision that both, I believe, Microsoft and Google uh, have for PWAs, and I believe, you know, Steve Jobs when he was um, first started talking about the iPhone had had a very similar uh, vision of you know using the web to kind of uh, leverage uh, you know com- communal development and stuff like that. But there, you know, as Joe mentioned that there are a lot of drawbacks uh, by not being able to create a native app. There are a lot of functionality issues that you, you lose out on and a lot of dev time that needs to be taken into account when you can't just focus on uh, a set of hardware architecture and chipsets. So uh, take, a, take a listen to that um, and, and then come back to us, uh, this podcast, and, and get caught up to speed about the potential and what you think about how Windows 10X uh, could be or rolled out from Microsoft, or if you're even going to try and buy a device with it. All, all around, just 10X is it's pretty much exciting for me as a Microsoft fan. It's breathing new life into Windows and letting people know that Microsoft is trying to move Windows into the future in the same way that Apple has done with Mac OS and that even Google has done with Android or Chrome OS. Have they really? Though I feel like they've been sitting on their butts for like the last three or four years. True, of true. But that, that'll be for a different podcast. Speaking of moving Windows into the future, for those of you who are like myself, who want to take baby steps versus giant leaps like <laughs> Eric, yeah. talk about Sun Valley. Uh, that is, I mean, for all intents and purposes, in comparison, is, is the baby steps to Windows 10X. It is, um, we had a big write-up about this uh, um, earlier last week. Uh, where a lot of information and came out about the potential mock, uh, look up, the, the potential look and feel of it through some mockups that were uh, created by artists over at Windows Central. Uh, just kind of jumping into it, a uh, little backstory is that uh, Sun Valley could be planned for the Windows 10 H uh, 21 H2 uh, rollout uh, for the second half of, tw- of this year, 2021. So I mean, it's interesting that none of us have seen any really. Uh, bits and pieces of it just yet. I mean, we started to get maybe one or two last week in last week's uh, in, insider dev build, and we've seen some uh, trickle out in, in a few apps or so. But they plan to have this out um, as early as October, uh, maybe November, and no one's tested it. So that'll be <laughs> that'll be interesting to see. Uh, maybe Hamilton- maybe we are testing it, but we don't know because remember a couple of weeks ago they were saying like how we were testing Windows 10X features, but it was hitting in the build. So maybe these features are there, but they're just not turned on yet. Yeah, I call that the double blind placebo effect, which equals out to nothing. <laughs> we didn't see it, they didn't see it, and it didn't really happen. Until I can actually like show you a screenshot of like, this is new compared to that old thing. Um, I'm not gonna say that I'm testing anything yet. But even uh, if there is something new, will we actually be able to test it? Because I know we, you and I were talking before this started is that there's the new news and interesting, and I I installed it on like four different computers and three different VMs, and none of them have it. And then well, you got yours after one week, and then Kip got his the same day he switched his Surface to to the Dev Branch. So I don't know how what they're doing here. Well, and we'll get to testing that in a second. Uh, I just want to kind of finish up with the back there, but yeah, this is part of that news and features thing is the reason why we need to test stuff, and I'll explain in a second. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, Panos himself uh, announced that last year the company was going to go accelerate innovation in Windows 10. And a recent Microsoft Jobs uh, listing teased a sweeping visual rejuvenation through the Windows experience. So they are staffing people. uh, I don't know, it seems retroactively late to staff people for a design that should be coming out 
this year. You figured you'd want them in. I mean, I guess if you have skilled people, they know what to do in a short amount of time. But I feel like this should have been a job posting two years ago so they could say, here you guys go. I'm sure Apple had something for Big Sur that came out, you know, nine years ago and they were able to roll it all out at once. But with that, that you know, with that being said, um, some of the things that um, we've seen, at least through the mock-ups, and the mock-ups are based on sourced information from uh journalists over at Windows Central. So they've spoken with somebody within Microsoft. They've talked to them and gotten some sort of audio validation of what the design could be. And then they had someone mock it up. So that's the trail there. So again, it could look a lot different than what we're <clears throat> seeing and sharing right now. But it seems to be, you know, based on the judgment of the writers, it seems to be pretty accurate that we're going to be seeing, you know, just in Windows 10 X, more rounded edges. <clears throat> that seems to be the theme. A little softer uh, visual emphasis, or a little softer emphasis on the Metro design. I mean, we're not losing it entirely, and we're not going into uh, what are they called? Squircles, square Squircles. Squircles. Yeah, we're not we're not seeing that, but we're just seeing the ever so uh, slight softening of uh, the edges in the Start menu uh, on of uh, all the apps. Essentially, you'll just see you know a, a rounded corner, so to speak. Uh, they've also seemed to have figured out, at least through the mockups, how to use the gray, the dark gray, and the, the night modes, the dark modes a little more consistently. Uh, I think, you know, they're partly there. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing. They've been working on it, and you, know, you can see it in stuff like Teams. Uh, in all of the Office UI, the, they use the same sort of gray. Um, a lot of the apps use the same sort of gray. It's really the settings menu that went with the midnight black for some reason. It hasn't changed it. They went midnight black and super acrylic, which seems to be not the same kind of visual ethos as everything else that they're using. So in the mockups, it seems like they've figured out how to do that. Um, the Action Center has been uh, really evolved. Um, it's not going to be, doesn't seem like just to be the entire left panel of the page, but <clears throat> broken into functionality uh, sections. So you'll have your sliding menus for uh, volume and lights or I mean the the lighting of your screen and under there you have bot, uh, buttons to kind of do a little more uh, quick control for that kind of stuff. Uh, there'll be a, a, an audio section, you know, for anything that you're listening to or playback uh, so you can quickly get to that instead of having it in the top uh, right hand corner and playing a little bit of, you know, uh, whack-a-mole when it shows up, you have to <laughs> click it really quick or try and change it over the next track. Uh, that seems to be one of the other things that they're doing with it. The start menu has been separated, at least from the mock-up, as we start separated from the taskbar, uh, which I don't know how that, again, when Windows 10X comes out, I wonder how they're going to merge the two, because I feel like consistency needs to be a big thing. And yeah, well, at least in the mock-ups for the Windows 10 uh, Sun Valley one, they have separated the task, uh, taskbar and the start menu for what purposes, I don't know, but there's at least a half inch gap between the two, at least, again, based on the mock-ups. Um, and then getting into uh, some actual functional UI stuff, because it's, you know, it's beyond just a design thing. Uh, they've actually broken out uh, tabs for Edge, it seems like, that, that'll be something that comes up. So you won't, uh, if you have a bunch of tabs open all over the screen, and they aren't grouped together, you'll be able to kind of see that in your timeline and pick which tabs you want to actually jump into versus picking uh, the grouped edge portion of that. Uh, which part, of get... this, part of that was introduced in the last Windows 10 update, I think, where you could switch between tabs with Alt and Tab, but this is just a prettier, more modern version of it. It's well, yeah. what I've seen with Zach. It's just like giving the, the little preview windows more touches of fluent design as it is in the leaked version of Windows 10X, which I was playing with. There you go. And then um, they have, uh, I think it's for its accessibility, they have a new uh, hover over uh, microphone slash audio uh, indicator that you'll be able to kind of uh, click into if you are, you know, screen recording or if you are listening to other things, you'll be able to kind of uh, click into that section. Um, and then, as I had mentioned at the top of this whole breakdown of this thing, uh, comes to the news and feature thing, which is you know kind of one of the big things that they started A/B testing, and that you know Arif is part of the B testing that gets nothing. <laughs> yeah, pretty uh, much. And I just got it. Um, you know that new news and section comes up, which is great. But this is what I meant about testing. 
uh, instead of you know how the start menu or anything in the taskbar kind of works now, uh, where you have to, you normally click into it, I know that you can do you can hover over an icon, and if you wait there long enough, uh, you'll get a visual uh, a visual indicator of what what the icon is doing. So if you are an edge, you'll get an indicator that this is the page that you're on. But again, it takes like you know half a second. That news and news and weather feature thing, if you hover it over, it, it instantly pops up. <laughs> and I thought it was going to be amazing because, you know, I'd love to, you know, get quick tidbits about information, the stocks I'll keep an eye on. But it becomes super annoying if you have to do anything on the left-hand side of your uh, screen because it's pretty wide. I don't think you can adjust the size to where it's a small icon. It's really <clears throat> half the size of your search bar if you leave the search bar open. So it covers a lot of real estate. So if you're hovering over to go turn off a mic, eject a USB drive or use something that uses USB. If you go to check on your volume for troubleshooting, anything on the right-hand side or left-hand side of your screen that's near the action center, it will pop up. But and you could you could turn it off if you don't want it. And I believe that the uh, when Zach was talking about Sun Valley many, many months ago, he was saying that it would come with a lot of sweeping design changes. But if you don't like it, you'd be able to switch back to regular Windows 10 because, you know, everyone always likes to push back on Microsoft. Hey, you changed my Windows. I don't like it. Yeah, but that's just like telling someone who, like, got ice cream and you covered it and just covered it in chocolate sprinkles. And they said, hey, man, I just want a little bit of sprinkles. Instead <laughs> of just throwing the entire thing out, it's just let's work on the compromise here. Like, I, I want the feature. That's true. That's a good point. But I don't want I don't want to just not have it. I just want it to function a little better, a little, you know, less in my face. I want to go over to that section. I want to engage with it, but uh, of my own recognizance, of my own free will. But uh, that's the point of the insider program is that they'll ask you if you tweet them and complain, hey, this stupid thing is in the way. Can you change it? Oh, no, so don't like, me file, wrong. Like, file your I've file been... your feedback in the feedback hub and they'll listen. That's yeah, why no, I've, I've actually again, I've got many badges by participating in feedback and I sent feedback. My only concern is that, you know, um, this is part of Sun Valley. And unless they start really initiating the ball on these features, we're going to get into October and, and November, whenever they release this or plan to release this. And there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be like me that want to get rid of the entire thing, just not to deal with it versus, you know, having spent this entire time, February, March, April, refining <laughs> yeah. it. So like, <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm afraid of. They're like, oh, we're going to do this in October. Here you guys go. And you're going to be like, well, this isn't what I really wanted. Or it could go the way of Windows sets and just disappear entirely. Ah, oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, like, like what, you, what you wrote about for Apple, like, it seems, it was interesting that, you know, uh, they seem to have come out of nowhere with Big Sur and, you know, for the most part, nailed it. I don't, you know, I don't know how Microsoft can do that. Um with windows 10 everyone is always a critic with windows 10 you cannot please everyone well it is but there's also something to be said about um refining the user experience enough that it just you know that it feels intuitive like the news and weather feature is sort of intuitive but again if hovering over it instantly pops it up there's got to be there's got to be a compromise and why is no one in the development area said like, hey, you know, maybe we give it a second to pop up or maybe you have to click into it. <clears throat> Something like that versus, oh, you hover over it, there it is. Uh, hopefully someone at Microsoft is listening to us and we'll make that change. Yeah, if not, give my <laughs> feedback. I'm close to getting a badge for that stuff too. And uh, speaking of change, uh, the, the Surface Pro 7 Plus, not 7, because 7 is last year's model, but Microsoft... <laughs> Microsoft kicked off CES 2021, although it's not directly happened at CES. It was just like a, a blog post. Where no, nothing they, happened at CES. Things yeah. just happened during last week called CES. It was a blog post that never happened. Well, that <laughs> happened late because the Windows blog was down. But they announced uh, Surface Pro 7 Plus, which is a new version of the Surface Pro 7 tablet but only for enterprise and education customers only. Uh, but anyone could buy it through the Microsoft Store for business. You don't need to show proof of ID or anything like that, but 
Well, they might now that you said that. <laughs> I don't know. I bought my my Surface Laptop three for business through the Microsoft Store, and it, no questions asked. But anyway, point is that maybe this is a Surface Pro seven that you might want to get because the model keeps the same design as the original Surface Pro seven, but with some small tweaks and under the hood changes. You're getting Intel's 11th gen core processors, and you guys, you guys remember how you could remove the SSD in the Surface Laptop 3 and the Surface Pro X? Well, that's now in the Surface Pro 7 Plus 2, and in addition to that, they're also introducing an LTE model, which I believe is new because they didn't have that in the Pro 6 and the Pro 7. It hasn't been in the Pro lineup since the... Pro 5 or the Pro, I just I think they just called it the Surface Pro. But anyway, Pro 7 Plus has the new LTE. And then another change is 15 hours of battery life, which is a big, a big, big improvement from the, I think it's 10.5 or 11 from the original Surface Pro 7. <laughs> yeah, the, um, this, I guess, first quarter refresh is interesting. Um, I can see why they're only selling it through these channels, especially if they have uh, refreshes coming out in October, or presumably that fall, fall time that they normally do. So you'll get people who are needing just, uh, you know, they might be in contract and, you know, get their renewed contracts for their new Surface devices for their employees and things like that. New chipsets will go a longer way than possibly a new design for them. So, um, I'm excited for people who want to go get that. I'm not personally excited for that yet because I do would like to see. I would like to see a refresh on the uh, Pro Seven design, something cl something more akin to the Pro X, if they can get anywhere close to that. Rounded corners, uh, more <laughs> more like like the Go Two, maybe. Yeah, yeah, the Go Two is amazing. I love that thing. Uh, yeah, if they can just uh, you know, give me something new, give me a reason to to, to go with a, a Surface Pro Eight versus a Surface Pro Seven Plus whatever <laughs> anyway the pricing is 899 on the base model would get which will get you a core i3 8 gigs of ram and 128 gigabytes of storage then the core i5 with the same configuration is a thousand dollars but 900 dollars for education and the core i7 version is 1600 dollars with 16 gigabytes of ram and 256 gigabytes of storage and there are three specific core i5 models with all with optional LTE. And the LTE models start at $1,150. And small note is that on the LTE models, there's no micro SD card reader under the kickstand because they have to put the SIM card tray there. Otherwise speaking, everything else on the Surface Pro 7 Plus is the same as all the original, as the original Surface Pro 7, same ports, same same design, same kickstand, same look, same color, same everything. Well, I wonder, because you mentioned the pricing uh, just a bit ago, I wonder if this is in line with the rumors we heard about uh, Surface finally being done with, at least the Surface Pros, being done with 4 gigabytes of RAM. Is, are we just going to have the, eight, the 899 for 8 gigs being the starter price for these devices from now on? I, you know, the 4 gigs are decent for people who don't do a lot but i feel like at this point even though i think would they say windows can run on four gigs or is it four gigs is okay for for modern computing but they made some plan. was it like two or something like it could run even lighter than four i thought or something like that i believe when terry was around terry myerson uh he made some lofty claim about it being less than four gigs and being able to run just just fine quote unquote um but i feel at this point just give people eight gigs at least start them with that well, I, I think I think four should be okay for now. But then, as as they're pushing more people towards the web, four might get a little bit too little bit because I you think know, so. Yeah. Anyway, uh, why don't yeah. you move move us on for, away from Surface to the other stuff that we heard in tech this week? Yeah, as much as I am a Microsoft fan and a Surface fan. There was a deluge of news from all kinds of Microsoft and Windows partners uh, with HP, with Intel, AMD. Again, this is being the week of CES, so uh, Samsung. and every, I mean, everyone had something to offer as far as devices, as far as concepts, as far as um, 
uh, IoT, uh, home devices, things like that. Uh, the biggest standouts, I think, for us, though, even though um, there was a lot of information, it was a lot of sort of redundant stuff. There wasn't a lot of like, ooh, look at this super cool new tech. I believe like the biggest new, the biggest story coming out of CES was that face mask, the new modified N95, like hologram, change your voice, uh, electric mask thing. That was like the biggest thing people were talking about. I think oh, Razor, like right? Stories. I think Razor is yeah, 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 Razor. Yeah. yeah, I think The Verge were like six stories on it. But if you're not interested in a mask, you want something a little more practical. Um, there were also a big push from a lot of vendors, especially Lenovo, for 16 by 10, finally, aspect ratios. Oh, yes. uh, I believe Lenovo does have a tablet that should be competing with the Surface Pro uh, coming out into the U.S. finally, officially. Um, I wrote back in May, reached out to some contacts. They had a, I think it was the Duet 7i was something that they released, which is a tableted PC, but it was only for international markets. And then they quietly released it in the U.S. Uh, about back in October, and they only sold a few, but they're making a bigger push uh, with their new uh, tableted PC device, uh, again, to go kind of after that uh, pro or service pro market. Uh, and that's running a three by two aspect ratio. But for the most part, a lot of people have finally moved on beyond 16 by nine and 16 by 10 to give us a little more real estate. Um, there was also a big talk from chipset makers. There's been a big push uh, from AMD this year. I mean, they've been kind of pushing for the last uh, two or three years, but they uh, came out with their uh, Ryzen 500 mobile CPU chipset uh, that should be giving Intel some more competition than they already have. Um, it's I believe based Panos on was there too, right? For the yeah, keynote. Yeah. Interestingly enough, yeah, like, you know, Microsoft doesn't make a big thing of CES, but um, they were there with AMD. And AMD, I think, um, is partnering with a lot of people. Uh, same, I mean, the same sort of people Intel has been partnering with, but these are people that AMD hadn't been uh, eligible to partner with prior to this new Ryzen uh, sort of chipsets that they've been coming out with just because they hadn't had the same sort of power distribution and the same sort of uh, acceleration uh, through their design. So now that they do, now that they're more competitive, we're seeing them kind of show up a lot of places. Um, the AMD U series chipsets, um, such as the Ryzen 7, uh, which is a 5.8, uh, uh, was it 5800 CPU, uh, 5800 U yep. CPU will offer up to 16% more single thread performance, up to 14% faster multi-thread performance uh, over its previous generation. Uh, and it's both, they're claiming 17 and a half hours of general battery usage, which is probably just watching, you know, 720p web versions of YouTube videos. So if you're pushing it, you could probably see, you know, at least 15, I mean, at least 10, uh, probably closer to, you know, 12 or 15 hours of battery usage, which is still really good. Um, they have a more powerful A series chip, uh, which is uh, you know HX CPU, right? Which is presumably for for uh, graphic intensive things, more towards gaming. Um, they said it's capable of up to uh, twenty three uh, twenty three percent increase in single thread performance and about seventeen percent in uh, seventeen percent faster multi thread performance. Uh, again, this is over previous generations, so I don't know how that compares to Intel directly, but. If anything, it should be matching what Intel's currently got. I don't know what they have down the road. Intel, um, Intel went crazy at CES though because they they unveiled more than fifty new processors for over five hundred new PCs. They literally had, I think, during the keynote, it was a table with like fifty laptops from front to back, showing you all of their new products in these process in these laptops. And then during the, their keynote, uh, we'll have the video footage. Obviously, they sh they kept switching before back and forth, back and forth between new devices and new laptops that are powered by their new processors. So with uh, Kareem spent a good bulk talking about the laptops that you'll see and what's new at AMD. So now let's just shift a little bit towards Intel because Intel has the bulk of the market right now. So Intel has a new 11. Gen 8 series mobile processors for ultra portable gaming laptops. They have a 35 watt TDP and apparently will deliver in quotation marks desktop caliper gaming. 
with, and there will be an eight core model with up to five gigahertz speeds and 20 lanes of PCIe Gen 4 architecture. And then they also announced the V Pro 11 Gen V Pro, which has a Kareem already said this, the new XE graphics inside and the new AI hardware acceleration and new hardware security features. And then for the low end, they have the six new Pentium Silver and Celeron processors, which are for education systems. You know, we always complain that these are slow, but Intel heard that, and now they're saying these new affordable CPUs should be, in again, in quotations, up to 35% better overall application performance and 78% better graphics performance gen on gen. But wait, there's more. The more, <laughs> the more exciting stuff, which which is in the desktop, we're talking about desktops now, there's the 11th gen Rocket Lake desktop processors, which are coming a little bit later this year. This will be their new flagship CPU, and they're promising this new desktop processor has 19% gen over gen instructions cycle IPC improvement for the highest frequency cores. Again, that's in quotes. And still not done yet. One more thing. I, I promise this is the last Wait, thing. There's more. This is the last thing they unveiled. And I'm running out of breath here. They're, <laughs> they're talking about the new Alder Lake architecture, which is something our Laurent was excited about. Reminder, he is a Mac guy, but he was excited about Alder Lake. And he told me, Make sure you mention this in the podcast. So this is for you. These new Alder Lake chips are expected to come in the second half of 2021. Uh, the, these are based on the 10 nanometer superfin process, but they also combine high performance cores and high efficiency cores. So these are expected to be a lot faster and a bit similar to what you get on ARM processors. So yeah, Intel has a loaded lineup coming your way this year. Yeah, uh, Intel's got a lot because uh, they've also got a lot of competition. Uh, we mentioned AMD, but Qualcomm also uh, released their, what was it, 8? Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. They released information about their upcoming uh, mobile chipset and uh, its performance. And this is going into um, match some of the Snapdragon stuff that Microsoft's going to be using uh, pretty soon. And some of the, or not only Microsoft, but other uh, OEMs and their um, Windows 10X devices, uh, if and when those do come out and be powered by uh, mobile chip processors, uh, this new Snapdragon will be amongst the, the top ones to use. I believe they'll also be kind of flirting with uh, AMD's new mobile processor as well. Um, and the, all this chip talk reminds me back to our podcast a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, where we were talking about Microsoft developing their own silicon. And I've, as soon as that was mentioned, I was like, oh, that's going to be uh, part and parcel with their work with AMD. Uh, I don't think they're going to, <clears throat> you know, s spend the same amount of time that Apple did to kind of do their own um, dedicated architecture like that. I think what they're going to do is they're going to leverage all the work they've been doing with AMD, especially on the uh, chipsets for the Xbox um, and in some of the stuff that they kind of flirted with <clears throat> with the Surface laptop uh, two years ago. And they're going to use that for um, their servers, which AMD is already, again, taking chunks out of <clears throat> Intel's uh, server business as well. So I, th I believe when, when if, if and when we do see Microsoft's uh, own silicon, it'll be have, have, have helped from AMD. So AMD is all over the place. I'm still going back to AMD. You said all the Intel stuff. I'm an AMD fan right now. <laughs> well, AMD stuff uh, has been faster than Intel stuff, but no, I think... Everyone is saying that um, Apple's M1 has changed the game, but Intel came strong at a CES with a lot of new chipset news. I mean, we have to see how it performs in actual hardware, but it does seem like it's pretty promising. Yeah, and how they price it. Uh, speaking of some of the hardware stuff too, uh, some of the highlights uh, aside from the 16 by 16 by 10 accelerations for a lot of these devices, uh, Lenovo uh, refreshed their uh, e ink display uh, ThinkBook. I think it's called ThinkBook Plus now, um, and it is, you know, just, I only saw the mock-ups, but it looks super slick. Uh, it's not a yoga like their other uh, designs where you can fold back 360 degrees. This, I think this is 180, but you do get a full um, 10 by, I think it's 10, over 10 inches, no, over 12 inches 
of e-ink display to use. I think 10 of it's actually usable. They have uh, bezels around the side of it. Uh, it also comes with a pin that's housed in the device uh, that can be used for both the uh, screen under the lid and the e-ink display as well. Uh, so again, it's super convenient and useful uh, for those uh, who are looking to you, you know, utilize convertibility in a, in a device uh, without doing this you know, traditional fold it back and touch the keyboard kind of thing. Um, the other thing about the e-ink display is that Lenovo's claiming 24 hours of continuous use on just the e-ink display. So if you are in a pinch, say you're traveling, whenever we get to do that again, um, and you need to do some light work, you can use the display itself for most of your travel, get to your destination, flip it up, finally flip it on and turn it on and get to some actual work. So uh, for those of you who like to fiddle or just want to you know, get the longest battery life out of a device, that's something to look forward to. HP came out with the uh, updates to the Envy the folio and their lead books. Um, and they're kind of, you know, I wrote in my piece that they're are blending professional and uh, personal work uses. Uh, a lot of the uh, power that you see from a uh, productivity device is being brought over to the creative ones and the creative designs are being brought over to the, the more professional looking uh, laptops for HP. So we're no longer seeing those big boat. I mean, they're still sort of bulky, but they're less bulky than they used to be uh, HP books uh, for productivity. So those of you who are looking for an elite book with a little bit of design and kind of something you could be proud of to pull out of a bag and put on a conference table, they got that for you. Uh, Lenovo also did an AR hit headset. I mean, they'll be using uh, their own uh, Lenovo software mostly for it. I do, I do believe it does support Windows uh, 10 in uh, mixed reality as well. But it's really, uh, it's less of the VR headset and more of a HoloLens sort of kind of competitor. It's a wired USB one now. Uh, it does look a little slicker than the uh, HoloLens 2 that's been out. But again, it's wired. So you, 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 give it, you give and take what you can get for mobility versus design uh, with that aspect. And then the last bit is uh, Lenovo's ThinkPad lineup, uh, which I'm always a fan of. Uh, I feel like they've done... A lot of great work and again they've moved it seems like practically every device for the thinkpad lineup at least being offered in 2021 announced at ces is using that 16 by 10. uh they're using you know um uh they still have the same sort of matte displays but their resolution has been bumped up a, a, just a tiny bit um they've also they're using they're also using ai but they're also pushing the lenovo advantage uh which i think is Critical, I mean, as far as uh, manufacturer billware, I feel like this is the best one. Again, helps guide people through the, U the UI and things like that. But uh, again, I wrote about all of the de devices and uh, I believe the, their Legion uh, devices also came out with some updates, uh, some more gaming specific ones for NVIDIA and G4 stuff. So uh, you can read about that on the site. But yeah, it was a lot of hardware um, from CES that I would love to play with if they can send it out. <laughs> I think that pretty much recaps like almost everything we heard at CES. You, we did a very good job of condensing, what is it, three or four days of CES into just 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> now we can talk about our week ahead, which is sans CES news. I did want to tease a piece that I'm, you know, fingers crossed, should be getting out next week uh, about uh, Eve Devices, which is a company we wrote about when they first came out with their Surface Pro S competitor, which, uh, you know, when I first used it and tried it out and tested it and reviewed it, really enjoyed it. Uh, the piece is not about rehashing that it, lovely experience. It's more about what's happened since then. Um, you know, we've gotten some people from Reddit that are, you know, are explaining a story that, you know, you'll want to read about as far as Eve and uh, the customer service especially in lieu of some of the new devices coming out that, again, we've written about. So keep your eyes peeled on that. And then, uh, like uh, Kareem uh, jumped me to earlier, my review of the Samsung HMD Odyssey Plus. Well, I focused last week on just the flight sim and the VR side. Now I'm going to do another piece just looking at Windows Mixed Reality probably three years later from when it was first introduced and the review of the hardware and how the hardware works in 2021. Yeah, you got to tell the people if you see rounded corners in there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's pretty fancy so far. I mean, I, you I see you saw me tweet about how how the um, how the the start menu works in Windows Mixed Reality and how the the homes the home is like a virtual home where you could go and and see pin your apps on the wall and open your desktop. It's it's pretty mind blowing stuff. 
I'm not gonna lie. I, I want to see a future where I can just like have a virtual home, like that isn't my house. Something I can design with my own home office in mixed reality. It'd be amazing. Design future, my ideal desk. With 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 COVID nineteen and coronavirus and all of that, the future maybe might be like everything is just virtual reality. Uh, that's what I've been saying since the start of this. I'm like, <laughs> how did Microsoft not push mixed reality and say like, hey, don't have a, a work desk at home. Put on a headset, and you're all you're all set. Well, I think that pretty much covers everything we wanted to talk about. I know we went a little longer than our usual thirty to fifty minute time frame, but there was a lot of news this week. Yeah, we just we love talking to you guys, so we couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> so again, find us on Twitter. I am at a back turn, and you are mindhead one. And of course, follow us our, on Microsoft on Twitter at on Microsoft and visit us at onmicrosoft.com for all your Microsoft news and information and even sometimes Apple stuff too. Yeah, and oh, you can thank Eric and, and Loren for that Apple stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and let's not forget Xbox. Yes, Xbox. We cover it all. So thanks for watching, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon. Same place, same time. Stay safe, wear a mask, and uh, we'll see you guys next week.